We're all set. We're rolling this So are you ready? Where did you grow up? And as a girl, how did your parents view your prospects in life as a black female? Well, I'm a third generation Washingtonian, born in a city uh, where residents had no vote in Congress, no vote for president of the United States, paid federal taxes, and had segregation in all of its facilities and schools mandated by the Congress of the United States. Uh, that didn't uh, sit well with my parents, but I must say that I was fortunate to grow up in a community of African Americans who thought something must be wrong with white people who would segregate us. We all wanted to be educated, <laughs> you know, so we really, this, is, this was a, an up south community where we never felt uh, some inferiority ourselves, but thought, thought something must be wrong with them. Uh, I'm the oldest of three girls uh, with parents who were like many parents of, of uh, my parents' generation, where few African Americans had uh, college education. My parents had worked their way through college. And as far as they were concerned, uh, when you got to the 12th grade, then you went to the 13th grade, which means you went to college. So that was always uh, a part of the aspirations of my family, it made it pretty easy to continue to do and to think about what you can do with your life. Was it a lonely place to be as a black female student at Yale in the early 60s? I was uh, among the um, first generation of blacks in any numbers to go to, to predominantly white institutions. For college, uh, interestingly, they, they all flooded into uh, my high school. Dunbar High School was storied because for years it was the only college preparatory high school for Negro children. Uh, and some very accomplished uh, African Americans graduated from that high school. Uh, interestingly, uh, Senator Edward Brooke, who became the first African American senator by popular e election, of Massachusetts is graduate of Dunbar High School to give you some sense of what kind of high school it was. You didn't have to take a test to get in to the school. You simply had to, to want to go uh, to college. Uh, therefore, this, the, the, when I went to college in the late 50s, um, most African Americans, much less women, uh, weren't going to college then, so you had really a tiny number going. But you can imagine that uh, um, black youngsters who wanted to go away to college were not about to feel lonely anywhere. If you're going to feel lonely, look, we had a flagship university right here, a great university, Howard University. So if you were inclined to to uh, be intimidated by white people, well, you know, you had the best uh, college in the United States for African Americans right here in your own hometown. Uh, so I, I never felt uh, lonely. I felt strange uh, uh, in the beginning when I went away to college. By the time I got to law school, all that was absolutely gone. This contrast to the the, the great wave of African Americans who came after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and people began to recruit in earnest uh, to, 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 to get African Americans to go to colleges. The, these, were, these were before those days. So that, that while it certainly felt very different, very, very different to have come from a city where everything was segregated, um, except the buses, uh, where you had had almost no contact with white people and young or old to finally find yourself in a sea of, of white people. But after that wore off, and it better way off quickly, <laughs> or you won't survive in that environment. Uh, I had a, a terrific time in college and law school. I spent four years at, at Yale. I have a master's in American studies and a law degree, uh, and I got th these degrees um, in part because of the way I was raised and because of, of my college education where everyone from Annie, I went to get the PhD. <laughs> and going to law school was like going to trade school. So uh, somehow the part in me that really wanted to be an intellectual 
uh, went to Yale graduate school and Yale law school at the same time, studied under some of the great historians, C. Van Woodward, the great civil uh, war historian, John Morton Blum, one of the great American um, historians. Uh, I got to do that. Who would pass that up? At the same time, I was going to law school uh, so that I got to feel that my education was fulsome, that I had gotten all that you're supposed to get. And you said that by the time you got to Yale Law School, you knew what you wanted to do. At the time I, I, I went to law school, there were very few African-American lawyers. Most of them represented criminal defendants uh, who needed help. Um, there were very few civil rights lawyers, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, of course. Uh, so it was natural for someone raised the way I was to want to be a civil rights lawyer. I was raised in a city of great consciousness, great black consciousness and black pride. Uh, I remember thinking um, when I was in college, well, why don't people just get up and demonstrate and somehow get rid of segregation? I was impatient. Uh, as young people will be, for why it had taken so long, 100 years after uh, a, a civil war and still uh, segregation um, laced the country and where you did not have straight legal segregation, you had rampant discrimination anyway. So I, I saw the law as one way to get involved. Remember, there was no civil rights movement. So if you wanted to do something that, that helped move black people out of, out of their virtual apartheid state, being a lawyer seemed to make good sense. So then something took you to the South where you joined SNCC? I got uh, to go to Mississippi, um, recruited by a very storied, uh, brave, man named Bob Moses, who had led the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, we called it the SNCC and still do, uh, in Mississippi. SNCC had broken open for every state except Mississippi, so of course I wanted to go there. Uh, and um, Bob um, recruited me to come. The, he came to Yale Law School to speak. Um, he wanted me to come to um, do a prototype for the, what became the summer of 64 when huge numbers of, of students from all over the country came. And the prototype I did was simply a workshop with local people talking about the Constitution and helping them to, to be able to answer enough of the questions to get up their nerves so that they could actually do it. Um, um, at that time, I went to Greenwood, Mississippi. There were all of, <laughs> of um, half a dozen SNCC workers. Uh, all that was in Mississippi was the NAACP. And it was so rare for civil rights workers to come into Mississippi that um, Medgar Evers um, met me at the airport. He had just, this is a grown man with children, he had led the sit-ins because it was so, so treacherous to engage in sit-ins in Mississippi. And he took me all around Jackson, Mississippi to, to try to convince me to stay there. I said, oh, I told Moses I was coming to Greenwood. I've got to go to Greenwood. He took me... Um, to the bus station that evening. And I got on a bus that took several hours to get there. As he went, when he went home, he was shot in the back and assassinated. I learned that, uh, not that evening. I, I came to an old uh, house where SNCC people had gotten place for me to stay. Um, the farm couple said they would be out picking whatever they pick, and they left me. They, they showed me that evening <laughs> a round tub, and they said that's how they bathed. 
I said, all right. <laughs> and I was in that tin tub, that washer tub, washerman's tub, when a little girl came and knocked on the screen door. And she said, are you the lady from the law school? I said, yes. She said, Mega Evers has been shot. <laughs> I quickly got my clothes on, went down the street to the SNCC office. Moses, Bob Moses, was still in the North uh, on one of his, his fundraising trips. And there was nobody there of any age. I, who was in my, by that time, second year in law school, was the oldest person there, and that just put me in charge. And they told me that the person who had been left in charge, a native Mississippian, Lawrence Giot, had gone uh, to get out of jail Fannie Lou Hamer, that she had come in on a bus, and that's why he wasn't there. And I looked around me and I said, well, what are these children there in high school? You know, where? What am I to do? So they said he had been put in jail, and uh, they asked me what to do since I was the one in law school. Uh, what I did was to ask them a lot of questions and learn that the local police chief in Greenwood was not one of them. He was as every bit as much of a racist, but he did not engage in violence. I went to see him, <laughs> and I said, I told him, I said, my name is Elna Catherine Holmes. <laughs> I told him how I had just come. I said, I go to Yale Law School. Lawrence Giot, I understand, has just been arrested uh, in Winona, Mississippi. I'm the oldest one here. I just got here. I got to go to try to get him out, asking only one thing of you. Would you call him and tell, tell him everything I told you? But tell him this, too. I've called everybody up north <laughs> to tell him where I'm going. And I don't want to be put in jail the way uh, Giot has been put in jail simply for trying to get Ms. Hamer out. I came over, and Giot had been in jail uh, overnight, a couple, couple of three nights, had been turned out to the white citizens' councils in, in the evenings, had been beat mercifully. He had no clothes on when I came. They had to take him away to put some clothes on. He was so uh, hurt. Fannie Lou Hamer had been beat unmercifully by a trustee. That was when I first met a woman who was to become my mentor. I came face to face with Mississippi violence uh, when I had barely uh, set foot on Mississippi soil. Robin Morgan did say that both you and she were in an early feminist group within SNCC. Talk about that transition. Well, Betty Friedan deserves the credit for waking up American women, but wherever women were, they began to feel this awakening. Uh, and uh, n uh, certainly no less in SNCC than, than elsewhere. SNCC was very male-dominated, just as all the great organizations, civil rights organizations were then, and you might expect to have been then. Well, some of us <laughs> were, felt pretty clearly how you respond that you could be both both female and black at the same time. And if you didn't think you could, you are. You need to come to grips with that. Um, how to clear up this confusion. There were a few good women older than me, mentors of mine, who certainly were very helpful. Shirley Chisholm was among the great leaders who did not hesitate to speak out as a woman. Dorothy Height another mentor, did not hesitate. And we were able to sort it out by yet yeah, women of my generation, women of their generation, few in number, but with uh, enough of, of a, a spotlight so that black women uh, were, in fact, listening. Um, we were, we, they, they started by forming their own groups. Uh, they, they do have now and did have then, then problems that were unique to them and, pro and issues that they had in common, not only with every American woman, but with every woman in the world. And the point was to make us understand that. But do not think that any of us who became strong feminists were instinctive feminists from the beginning. Um, 
When I was in law school, there was a woman, again of another generation, an African-American woman named Pauli Murray. Pauli Murray was a straight-out feminist. Uh, she had come back to law school uh, to get a degree that most people don't even pursue. It's a doctor of laws degree. And she um, was a very pronounced feminist. That was the first time I had come in contact with a black feminist. Now, uh, Polly was in her own ways quite peculiar, brilliant, but quite peculiar. But we listened to her. Um, and, and, and I realized that this was something one had to learn. It was not nearly as instinctive as having black skin and being put in a school because of that black skin. Uh, in fact, I knew one of the reasons that, that I never felt instinctively feminist, I'm the oldest of three girls, there was no boy competing with me. <laughs> we, were all, we were all being, being urged to be whatever we could be. But I do remember something that strikes me as amazing today, that when I applied to law school, besides applying to Yale, which I really wanted to go to, but you always apply to other schools and you want top draw schools. Another school I applied to was New York University, but I didn't simply apply to the law school. I applied for a very special fellowship. Now, the, law schools don't give fellowships. This was the only law school I knew of where you could get a very large fellowship. I applied for it. I got back a letter admitting me to the law school, giving me a scholarship of considerably less <laughs> worth, and indicating that that fellowship was available to men only. I must tell you, I did not say, oh, how terrible. I said, I should have read the fine print. So if somebody tells you she was born in this world as a feminist, uh, I think she's giving herself too much credit. Uh, I, it, it was so inculcated uh, in us that, that that was the way the world was. And for me, uh, who came from a two-parent family with three girls, all being encouraged to be everything you could be, uh, feminism or what men did versus what women did, really never much crossed my mind when I was a kid. My mother was a teacher. My father also worked. So we had two working parents, <laughs> uh, 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 encouraging uh, that, that their three girls would go to college. And then I came in touch with the real world, where lots of girls hadn't had that kind of upbringing and wouldn't, one, wouldn't have thought of going to college, and two, if they did, certainly wouldn't want to do much with the degree they earned. So did you have a click moment? I don't think, I don't believe in click moments. I learn, you listen, you study, you learn, you learn, from, I learned to be a feminist from being black. I learned to be a feminist from being denied my rights as an African American. That, will, that should educate every African American as to anybody who is denied uh, her rights or his rights. And, and over time, it, it, it became absolutely clear. It wasn't a moment in time. Uh, it, wa it was my experience in the civil rights movement, uh, what I read. Uh, being a part of a burgeoning movement itself that is itself an educational process. All of that came together and it became clear that, that um, what, what uh, had begun with the right to vote had never been finished. When you were the ACLU legal director, you were hired to bring a class action suit against Newsweek. Tell me how you came to be in that position and what the situation was at Newsweek at that time for women. Well, I th a, a, a woman called me up and, and told me, who worked at Newsweek, I, I was the assistant legal director and she told me about women at Newsweek and how they were employed. I said, are you sure? I, have, I need to meet with these women. What she told me and what turned out to be true was that Newsweek at the time w was hiring uh, the top of the 
of the lot, the best of the best women, and, and employing them as researchers, and hiring their counterparts and bringing them in as reporters. I had to satisfy myself that this was systemic, and what I found was that was with virtually, with very few exceptions, a two-track system, one for women and for men. It was, it was one of those extraordinary cases a civil rights lawyer yearns for. I met with the women, and, and I must say it took some uh, meetings and consciousness raising first. These women had a lot to lose. Perhaps if they stayed, they could rise in the ranks. And so in a real sense, this was not simply an exercise in cross-examining and find out, are you sure? I mean, these were Phi Beta Kappas. These were, were women who had been Fulbright scholars. These were women at the top of their classes, at the best schools in the United States. I wasn't simply dealing with comparable people. I was dealing with the very best against whatever men in Newsweek hired. But uh, saying that is one thing, when there have not been many lawsuits of the kind brought. In fact, I don't know of any at that time, uh, certainly not involving a, a, an entire group of women at a great corporation. Uh, you, you, you need to meet with <laughs> your clients to make sure they know what they're getting into. Uh, and it was important to, to foster the notion of solidarity, that no single woman should ever have to do this. But if all of us do it, uh, then we have something real here. And so it took a number of meetings, and I insisted that when we have the press conference, we're not going to have some representatives, we're going to have everybody there. Is that all right with everybody? Wanting to make sure that if people had fears, we'd either overcome them or we wouldn't bring suit until we did. Uh, and I was working with extraordinary young women who, who were candid, who were analytical, who gave me the straight dope, uh, who were willing to meet, uh, willing to spend the time. Uh, and we had a big press conference where we <laughs> laid it out. Um, not long afterwards, uh, uh, I was then living in New York. Not long afterwards, Newsweek reached out uh, for a settlement it wasn't that I was invited into the office. That's not how it happened. They reached out. When you have a lawyer, they reached out. They want to begin to talk settlement. Um, I had um, two conditions. Um, I would bring some of the women with me, uh, but I would insist that Catherine Graham be there. Catherine Graham was the publisher of the Washington Post and of, of Newsweek magazine. And it seemed to me important that this woman, this very accomplished woman, uh, hear what it was we were demanding. Um, <laughs> but this was, <laughs> uh, Oz Elliott became a good friend, so did Kay Graham for that matter. But on, on this occasion, they didn't quite know what to make of me because I was heavy with child. <laughs> I was obviously pregnant. Uh, and so they were, were solicitous, and they uh, sat on a couch. And so they quickly got me a chair to sit. So I sat on the chair, but they were on the couch, so that put me in a kind of throne, talking down to these men. I'm sure they never meant that, but they were over solicitous of my pregnancy. So here I was, negotiating from on high, with them kind of in the valley, looking up. They did it, not me, but it was great fun. Uh, I never got to finish that. I had to turn the case over to another very fine lawyer, Harriet Robb, because Lo and behold, I was appointed to be the chair of the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Uh, the case was finally settled, and, and the rest is the history of the integration of, of women into the uh, high sectors of America's uh, signature pub publications. Why was there a need for a black feminist movement? We weren't going to attract uh, black women 
on the heels of the civil rights movement to a movement that seemed all white and seemed uh, by virtue of its experience not to reflect uh, the lives of African American women. So you start where you are, with women where they are. And if you do, you will be able to make them understand in the long run what they share with other women in, in our country. But you don't just say to them, you're like everybody else. That, will, that would really turn off African American, would have turned off African American women, especially then. I think it would today as well, even though African American women are integrated throughout the women's movement, they still jealously maintain their own organizations which are, are zeroed in, targeting their, their own special needs. You can do that and still be a part of the larger group. In fact, um, one of the best arguments that I believe uh, we, we have ever had and ever used is the notion that the larger the number, the more diverse the number, the harder, the harder it is for them to ignore us. And this must be said, that the women's movement was the first great movement I know of, which in its initial documents uh, spoke directly to race and not simply to their own concerns. Uh, the movement understood what had raised its consciousness. Women had spent 10 years, essentially, seeing black women and men uh, uh, take enormous risks for their freedom. And that consciousness-raising effect uh, was with the great organizers of the women's movement. Uh, and in their initial documents, they, they reflect that. Black women had to understand first who they were as a part of a women's movement. Remember, black women were very much a part of the civil rights movement. So what does it mean for you as black women to speak up when you are doing so without black men in the room? That's what uh, organizing as black women was all about. I remember in New York, uh, they had um, uh, the first great women's parade down Fifth Avenue. And in order to attract black women, I did something that was completely uncharacteristic of me. I, I was not an Afro wearing, I was an Afro hair wearing, but I was not an Afro turban wearing. I wear my hair Afro because that is natural. It would have been unnatural for me to wear a turban. Well, I wore a turban <laughs> to say, I'm black. Look, everybody, I'm black. I'm the human rights. I, I was human rights commissioner, I think, at the time. So I said, I'm trying to make a statement. I'm, 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 I'm walking down Fifth Avenue with white women indicating I'm one of them and one of you too. <laughs> so try to figure that out. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the concerns that black women had. Black women had worked alongside black men in the cotton fields with everybody picking his bale of cotton to make what the man said you had to, to, to pick in order to, 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 to be in that, in, in that place at all. So the, the notion of, of a foundation for the movement uh, uh, being that, that women should be allowed uh, to work was a turnoff, was, was a, one of the reasons why black women had to get in there and lead this, lead this black women's movement. Uh, it, it was a turnoff, not because it was wrong, no, not because everybody <laughs> thought that that shouldn't happen, but because it pointed up the difference between black women and black men, uh, uh, sorry, black people and white people. Well, you begin to uh, to talk about elementary issues like open a newspaper. Um, you've gotten rid of black and white. That's good. But black women, you still got a problem, don't you? Because the newspaper says these jobs are for men, these jobs are for women. So the notion of the um, double problem begins to set, set in and how you cannot work on one problem without working on the other. When you then were appointed to the EEOC by President Carter, 
I've read that you were surprised more women didn't come with sexual harassment complaints. When President Carter uh, appointed me to chair the, the comparable national agency, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the problem uh, really stemmed from certain kinds of, of complaints that women uh, did not feel, and most prominent among them was, was sexual harassment. Uh, and, and yet, what complaints we saw were horrendous. Sometimes I wouldn't call them sexual harassment. I would call them sexual assault. In this case, I didn't have the luxury of being able to go around the country saying, why don't you file some sexual harassment complaints? Um, but I did have a tool at, at, at hand. Um, I could issue regulations. And we, in fact, issued the first um, uh, sexual harassment guidelines. They were later uh, affirmed by the Supreme Court. And once you get something into law that way, where, where, whereby the statute itself, which does not say sexual harassment, but says there should be no discrimination on the basis of sex, among other things, once you get an interpretation that says that includes sexual harassment, then women be begin to come forward. It's in law, it's been blessed. I met with employers who were, who were beside themselves initially that I would come forward with such regulations, and then we had a very good talk and I told them what to do. I said, uh, you are now in a very vulnerable position uh, because anybody can file a complaint against you and you don't know what to do in your own workforce. Now you have some regulations and you, sh you must use these regulations. Uh, make sure that every supervisor has them. Protect yourself. Uh, you don't have protection and women don't have protection when the law is not spelled out as it should be. Do you feel that the revolution for women is over? Was it an incomplete revolution in the sense that there's still a lot of work to be done? Revolution is not a permanent matter. It wouldn't be a revolution. Uh, so, the labor movement calls itself today a movement. Well, it was more of a movement in the 30s than it is today. It is, it is a very traditional and powerful part of society. We who are black, we who are female, still refer to the women's movement and the civil rights movement. Those words mean that it's going to take more, forgive me, movement to get us to the full equality we deserve. But the word revolution is one that women could genuinely put on those uh, early years when we had huge breakthroughs in, in law and in, in, in society and in traditions. That continues, I, I, the, the revolution isn't over. The revolution has spawned energy that continues to carry forward uh, the, the revolution in what we now call the women's movement.